First of all, thank you here for thank you all for having me here. Um, it's a pleasure to come and talk to some coaches about strength and depth. It's, it's a real interest of mine, a passion of mine, and we're going to talk about strength and power development uh, regarding strength and depth. So. Basically, this is the outline. We're going to talk about some basics, some underpinning theory. Then we're going to talk about strength development in particular, then power development. Then I'm going to talk about when you have to use mid strength and power sessions. And lastly, we'll talk about some special methods. So, um, this uh, there's a few formatting issues it seems on the slides, but Bruce Lee's like, for me, the great modern philosopher. He's like, absorb what is useful, discard what's not. So, anything I tell you, anything I see, or anything. I get presented with it. I'm always thinking, hey, can I apply this? How am I going to apply this? And where am I going to apply it? Um, there's another great Bruce Lee uh, quote where he said, when I started, a punch was just a punch and a kick was just a kick. When I started mark, or when I started mark, when I first started the art, a punch was just a punch, a kick was just a kick. When I started mastering the art, a punch became more than a punch. A kick became more than a kick. And when I finally mastered the art, a punch was just punch and kick was just a kick. So this speaks to like the level of, I think the level of knowledge that people go through and there's a lot of uh, mysticism about what you can do with that and how things can uh, be progressed. But I really think that it goes from simple to complex back to simple. And I've got a few uh, few more slides or a few more things that I'll touch on with that. The next thing is efficiency. This guy, I think he's actually Polish. Thomas Kurtz is his name. Um, and uh, he's got this, this wonderful book called Science of Sports Training. And one of the big things I got out of that was the principle of efficiency. Always do as little as possible to get as much as possible to. If you can train maximum speed twice a week, then you get the same results as if you do it three or four times a week. Why would you do it three or four times a week? Because in essence you're just fatiguing the system of the athlete. So always this principle of efficiency. I always come back to these this type of thoughts, this type of mindset. Um, if I can eat 3,000 calories a day and lose weight or be in athletic condition, why would I eat 2,000 if it gives me the same condition? So always these principles, I think of. And then what would my grandmother say? This is my biggest filter on life. People say, ah, oh. so if you go and see a strength conditioning coach, they say, oh, you need to lift weights to run fast. You go and see a yoga teacher, oh, you need to be flexible to run fast. You go and see a physiotherapist, oh, you need to be aligned to run fast. Everything needs to be in its proper spot. What would your grandmother say? Well, probably if you want to run fast, you should be running fast. So these are my type of filters I always think of. And then I want to talk about adaptation. Very simply, you either have peripheral or central. So peripheral, we get adaptation uh, in the, in the muscles, we might get hypertrophy, we might get greater ability of, of force generating capabilities within the muscle. Central is, it comes from the nervous system. So we get enhanced, basically enhanced electrical signals to the joints so we can coordinate them in a more efficient way, intermuscularly, or coordinate within the muscle, uh, intramuscular. <laughs> then this other principle is the dose response. Like anything, I, I, I can't say this for certain, 100% back, but for me, most things in life have an inverted gym, where well, there's always these close response curves. If you do too little sprint training or speed work with athletes, they're not going to get faster. If you do too much, they're going to get injured. If you do too little weights, weight training with athletes, they're not going to get any stronger. If you do too much, they're going to get injured, or they're, they're going to be too fatigued. So always there's this dose response curve, and you've got a margin of safety. And uh, Craig Purdom kind of alluded to this type of concept yesterday with the, the sort of golden window and how an AFL that sort of found that 8 to 11 maximal high speed running effort uh, is about right for where they think it's protected and, and sort of golden zone. But we've got this and we just need to figure out where it is. And every athlete will be different. Not, it will probably change from year to year. With because an athlete gets older, an athlete might have had an injury, uh, an athlete's mindset will be different. Now they might have something else going on outside their life. All these things impact, and it's up to the coach to kind of try and find this 
this perfect first response. Power models. Power models, if there's one thing I can get you to think about after this uh, lecture, is when you go into the gym, you want to stop thinking about kgs lifted. You want to start thinking about watts and start thinking of wattage model. So, typical mass. We go into a gym, we do a squat, 200 kg, whatever, 150 kg. We think, oh yes, we'll put more load on the bar. I want to change that thinking to say, how much power did you produce in the gym? Today? What was the wattage? What was the wattage compared to your own body weight? And this type of thinking, these type of power models, will give you a new understanding of what you're producing or what, what actually work you're doing in the gym. Is an athlete getting stronger? Yes, maybe, maybe they can lift more weight, but how is that weight being lifted? How much power they're producing into each repetition? And while we're on here, power can be calculated in basically in two ways. Force times velocity, which is what we call instantaneous power. This is something you might be concerned with an athlete. The, the first step out of a block is where you really have to dial in. The other way we think of is work divided by time. Now work divided by time is the main way of how I focus on power. Because essentially that's a 100 meter sprint. You've got 100 meters, that is your work. Divided by time, 10 seconds, and that indicates a good result. So if it's divided by 12 seconds, your power isn't as great. So I call this continuous power. And these are the type of changes in thinking for Coaches and strength coaches, I like to promote something in this water space model. I'm, I'm pretty much guarantee you, you've probably seen a version of this slide in almost any strength conditioning lecture you go to. Um, <clears throat> basically, we've got three lines in here. On the y-axis is force, on the x-axis is time in milliseconds. You've got your three lines. The solid black line is an untrained person. So this is a person be like me right now, walk up the street, haven't done any weights, um, this will be the type of force I'll be producing. The heavy street training person is the solid dash line. So if you see at 500 milliseconds, there's a big difference between untrained and heavy resistance training. However, most sport <coughs> only has a specific window for you to produce force in. In sprinting, maximum velocity, Maybe 80 to 90 milliseconds. Maybe 90 to 100 uh, if you're a bit slower. If you're, say, you're sprinting in soccer, maybe it's 110. Last step in a long jump, 120 milliseconds. So you only have a finite amount of time to express this force. Now, this brings me to the last line, which is the dotted line, which is explosive ballistic strength training. If we look here at 200 milliseconds, there's a clear difference between the solid, untrained line the dash line with heavy resistance training, and then the explosive strength training. E.g., you can express more force in those shorter windows of times. Now, I mentioned a couple of those contact times, 80, 90 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds. If we think about, we want to be here on this, on this x-axis, it makes even a bigger difference to what you're doing in the gym and how you're going to be training people. Um, this, is a, this is an example, I'll just bring it up, I'm not going to dwell on it too much, but I've been a little bit through the Chinese women's volleyball team before I actually worked for Chinese track and field. I worked for two years with the Olympic Committee, and I mainly spent time with their weightlifting team. I'm going to bring up some weightlifting examples. Um, but as an example, and this is a, a, I'm a coach first and foremost, so a lot of times subjective feedback I get is probably more important to me than, than numbers or how I feel about certain things. It can sometimes be more important than numbers. So anyway, these girls, they're always pretty good. They did in the gym big heavy squats. Um, some girls that weren't that good at volleyball would be much stronger. Some girls that would be uh, not in the starting team would be strongest in the team. They started instituting velocity-based training, and just started thinking of wattage-based model around their training. And suddenly, all the all the best players. It started to become clear that the best players were the ones that actually moved the bar the quickest in the weight room. They were the ones that could accelerate the most in their jumps. And you really got this buy-in from what they're doing. From there, they end up winning a gold medal. I'm not going to say it's because of velocity-based training. They were a really good team, but 
It's that buy-in that you get from Athens where you go, okay, wow, I can actually see that, hey, I'm not, I might not be as maximally strong as this person, but at the same relative weight or the same weight, I can actually move this bar quicker. Then that starts to make sense, especially if you're a speed athlete or a jumping athlete. Um, this is training equals rehab. So for me, there's no difference between what you do to prepare an athlete for maximum performance and what you do to prepare an athlete for rehabilitation or prehabilitation. It's exactly the same thing. If you can give an athlete the ability to handle more force and different vectors of force, they will become more resilient. They will be able to uh, hopefully get through more and more seasons unscathed without being injured. We know there's a lot big thing right now going on with training load monitoring and, and acute to chronic workload ratios and making sure we're, we're not doing too much in sort of the last most recent period compared to what we've done in the sort of preceding periods. But all those things are modified by your force generating capabilities or your maximum speed. E.g. if you have greater force generating capabilities or power generating capabilities, it modifies those ratios. It means you can handle more work. It makes it safe for you to handle the work. And this is another one that uh, I get a lot in, in the question of can you put, can you train for performance when an athlete still has dysfunction? Can you train for performance when an athlete might have something going on in a physio screen or, or, or there's, he's not moving quite right? Now in the real world, as a coach, you, you have to, because nothing is ever perfect. Nothing. There will be nobody that has a has a perfect symmetrical uh, posture, perfect symmetrical movement screen. It doesn't exist. All there is are bandwidths, bandwidths of what's acceptable, what's not. And my my idea is, you can put performance on dysfunction, but you probably need to take into account the dysfunction and address it at the same time. But do not, please do not uh, stop training for performance completely to address the dysfunction. And just to highlight this, this is a guy I worked with closely, uh, his name is Shin Young, pre before when I started working with athletics. Now, have a look at his squat and his squat pattern. I think it's some dysfunction there. Mm. They're actually confused right now. They think it's lifted something a little bit heavier than what he has. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you're looking at that, you just say, oh, we might need to do something about the squat. Doesn't look too good. In reality, this guy is a uh, gold medalist, world champion, um, and he does that consistently. It's uh, maybe an issue with the upper kinematics of his hip joint. So maybe there is, if, if, if we didn't put performance on dysfunction in that case, maybe he wouldn't have been a gold medalist. Maybe you wouldn't have uh, had those, had that success. And it was, it was a great actually education for me working with the Chinese weight lifting team. We, I, I spent, my first 18 months I was working for the Chinese Olympic Committee in, in China. And we spent, or well, I spent the wrong amount of those 18 months with the weight lifting team. Um, and, uh, it's not a bragging thing, but the, their level of success is, is unparalleled. We went to the 2015 World Championships in Houston. The worst result for the women's team, and it's mainly, it's quite interesting, the women's team is actually more, um, more prestigious and more important than the men's weightlifting team in China. It's common for the head coach of the men's team to then become the head coach of the women's team as a career progression, which is, uh, I found it quite interesting. Maybe I'm, uh, maybe I'm uh, chauvinistic, I don't know, but when I first got I was like, oh, this is a bit strange, but anyway. We went to the 2015 World Championship Women's Team, the worst result in any weight class, any lift, was a silver medal. So it was the education I got over there and seeing how the coaches worked with that was, was tremendous. Uh, but 
one of the things is that, yes, you've got to be aware that it's function, but you, you've got to keep moving forward to what the actual end goal is. And uh, one of the consistent themes I see with a lot of presentations is we talk about force generating, um, the ability to generate more force. Well, again, I want to reframe this, and it was consistent yesterday as well. You, you, although force, it's, it's good to think of, yes, we want to generate more force and handle more force. You want to start thinking in power. For instance, you might be able to handle large magnitude of force, but if it's applied at a very high rate, which would indicate high power, you might not be able to handle that, and that's when injuries would happen. So I'm sure everyone's heard of people blowing out their backs, picking up the TV remote, uh, just getting off the couch. Part of that is due to the power associated around the lumbar segment. So they will be here, there's not much force with lumbar flexion, but the angular velocity becomes very high and that produces this power which, which causes, or which may cause or, or influences that, those symptoms. So when you start thinking of things, think of the power and okay, I not just want to be able to generate more power, but I want to be able to withstand more power at the joints. And so this is not just the magnitude of force, but also the rate at which that force is applied. <coughs> As a general rule, I've got three stages of training. First one, you've got to be able to control the movement. So, if I want to do a bicep curl, I should be able to do this. The next one is a ball athlete. I should be able to feel which muscles are supposed to be working. So, if I'm doing a bicep curl, I should be able to feel the biceps working. The final one, once you've got that, is then you can actually train the movement. Then you can train for speed and power. Because if you don't have that kinesthetic awareness, Say so you've got athletes that can do a squat, they feel their quads working. If they don't, if they don't have that mind muscle awareness, I'd probably say they need to stay there until they do. And then when they can feel that and they do, they have that kinesthetic awareness, they have that body brain uh, link, then you can start training the movement. And a lot of times, and this is typical bodybuilding type stuff. And it's for the battle network, work. But I still see a lot of elite athletes, elite uh, and, uh, and speech marks, that haven't gone through the stage and have issues here producing force or power because they don't have that mind body awareness. So, this is another slide you see in, in almost any strength condition. The force velocity curve. We've got force on the Y, velocity on the X. Basically, as force goes up, velocity goes down. As velocity goes up, force in turn has to go down. Now, if you want, when you first start with that, your aim is to promote an even distribution of this. So, we're going to have to do some heavy weights, like powerlifting, squat, bench, deadlift. This is where we'll sit. High force, low velocity. Make some Olympic lifting. We're moving down the, down the curve here. Some jumps, loaded jumps. We can't forget the throws. The throws are just like an Olympic lift, but with a light implement. Then jumping, more force. Sorry, slightly less force, but uh, uh, faster velocities. And then obviously sprinting. So your aim, when you first start with that, that is you've got a curve here. You probably want to give them all of those activities to give them a balanced force velocity output. And this is what it looks like. This is this is the thing that I sort of suggest. Great kid. When I 
I used to get asked a lot about working with, I worked with two sprinters in China. One was, uh, well, I worked with the 4x100, the woman's team, and Wei Young Lee, the girl that was in there just before, and then two male sprinters, Shi Jin Yi and Super Ken. Um, people asked me about, like, what was, because he had a, a lot of improvement in that during the time that I was there. He was a 200 meter national record holder, he ran the 200 in London, he decided to concentrate on 100. When, when I first started working with him, he was a 10-2 runner. In the last period of working with him, he'd run under 10 twice, but wouldn't assist it. After I left, and maybe three months after I left, he ran a uh, sub-10, a 997. And people asked, what was the change? Like, what, what did you actually think helped that guy or, or, or improved that guy? And I've, I've had very experienced coaches say to me when he was a 10.2 guy, um, He'll never run any faster. He's a, he's a little bit of an awkward runner. And he'll never run any faster. He's like a 10 2 guy, he'll just be stuck around that. Uh, but the dude just keeps improving. A little bit by a little bit. And I've, I've had to think really critically about what, what actually took him more from a physical standpoint. Because his technique didn't really get any better, in my mind. His coordination and drills didn't get really better. Which is, I'm going to contrast that with another example later on, but things that did get better. His flexibility improved dramatically. When, he, when I first started working with him, the dude was like this. Me. Okay, what would my grandmother say? Boy, you can't touch your toes? That might be a problem. <laughs> so, his flexibility improved dramatically. Um, the other thing that improved was his ability to express what I call hydrostatic power. And I'll talk about that in, in a second, but his ability to express power, high levels of power, at life and life alone, rather than at a maximum level. But there's some pros, specific type of jump for uh, some starts. And some sprints. Hey, Polish uh, 4x100? Oh, yeah. Women's team. true. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. So, me and that guy share, uh, we just done a session. We were up at the pool at the hotel. Um, um, we are up at the pool at the hotel afterwards, and all the pol Polska girls come up afterwards, and we're like doing some pool recovery and some of these things. And these girls, if you haven't seen them, are just like, and like, literally, had eight packs going on. We looked at one another and we're like, we might need to get out and put a t-shirt on because we're starting to feel embarrassed around these girls. They were uh, very, very, very uh, physical specimens, I'll put it that way. Um, but this is, uh, it's cut out there, but it's young at all, Warren Young. And these are some sample exercises based on velocity. Now, if you, if you adhere to something like this, specific adaptation to impose demand. And these are your typical exercises in the gym. Squats, a 1.5 to 2.5 meters per second. Power things, 2 to 2.5. Jump squats, 1.6, 2.6. Actually, well, body weight jumps, 3.1. Actually, so the long jumpers would all get over 4 meters per second. So this is uh, with, with the counter movement jump of body weight. And in my experience, with, with Elite jumpers and the sprinters would be there or there about 3.8, 3.9. So this is a bit low, and this is done on uh, from uh, like a football population as far as I remember. Assisted jumps. Now, then we look at sled sprints: 8.2, bounding 5.9, speed bounding 8.2, sprinting 10, 11. What would your grandmother say? Are you going to get good transference from speeds this high to when you need to run at speeds this high or higher? <coughs> Maybe when you first start, when you first start to do anything with somebody, they'll get better. But as you progress and get more and more developed and more and more specialized, you have to start thinking, how am I going to make an impact? How am I going to get transferred? And the aim, is to take your initial force velocity curve, which is pretty even, and then you want to bump it right around the velocity side of things. 
Couldn't do that. You gotta do more jumping. Or you gotta do more sprinting. And I'm gonna give some examples on this, but the how you do it is you have, you have to one play with a few variables to my mind, and then also uh, there's a still acquisition effect that comes along with playing with these variables. The other thing you have to think of, this is a power mass uh, curve. So we've got mass on the X, power on the Y in watts. And it could be watts per kg, it could be relative power, doesn't matter. When you first start, blue line, it'll look something like this. This is what it says in the textbook. It's always a nice inverted U type curve. So maybe you produce the mass amount of power at 90 kgs. Your aim then is from here to make the curve like a green curve. So now you can produce more and more power at 70 kgs, more and more power at 80 kgs, more and more power at 60 kgs. Because unfortunately, you don't get to run down the track with a barbell on your back so you can have more power. The whole idea is to be able to generate more and more power and get it closer and closer to the body weight. We'll keep the same level of power that you can produce with a certain weight and move that closer and closer to the body weight. One of the secrets I had, well, and I picked this up from Randy Huntington, who is a big time believer in Pfizer, is pneumatics. If people in Melbourne, I know uh, Todd and uh, Nick here, they've got a, a facility that has Kaiser and I would say first of all there's been a little bit of research on this, not much but there is. So um, there's a guy Brilliant and a guy, I want to say Bishop, but don't quite know that. Anyway, they found a greater transference to what we call high velocity power from using the matters. So with, what that means is that power can be low velocity or high velocity, or it can be medium velocity. If we look here, this would be low velocity power, e.g. you're getting your power predominantly from the amount of weight that you're moving. Because remember, force is mass times acceleration, and power is force times velocity. So you're getting your power by the mass. This would what we call what we call low velocity power. Down here is what we'll be calling high velocity power. You're getting your power from the acceleration and from the velocity parts of that equation. If you want to be a good sprinter or jumper, it's highly likely you want to get it from the acceleration, the velocity parts of the equation. And this is how we do it with the, the common uh, long jump drill, but you use something that's a little bit heavier or a little bit lighter <coughs> around these two segments of the force velocity curve. So you use something a little bit heavier with your jump, something a little bit lighter with your jumps, something a little bit heavier when you run, something a little bit lighter when you run. Got the Chinese record holder, an 847 long jumper. This is some resistive loading running. So straight leg bound with the barbell on the back, pretty simple run. Assisted jumping, pretty simple. Put your hands on something, use your hands to help you get a little bit higher, get a bit faster. He's a a decent high jumper, a jungle weight. Character, I don't know if you, um, he's this guy, if you've ever seen him. <laughs> um, they call him, so his coach's name is Huang, which means yellow in Mandarin, and then his nickname is Huang Ka, which means yellow card, because he got yellow carded when he uh, ripped open his uh, singer at a, I can't remember what competition, but he's a 238, he hasn't had much success recently, for various reasons, but he's a, he's a to a medalist in 2015 from here. And this is a pole holder. And so this is an assisted unloaded run. And funny story here, so this guy's coach is French, right? And French are all a little bit, uh, I'll just say unstable, mate. But uh, <laughs> he goes, ah, my boy, there's no balls. You can't run into the pit fast enough. And so we get the 1080 and we drag them into the pits, yeah! <laughs> Maybe we just do it on the, on the side of the track first, make them run so you're not dragging them into the pit, and we'll see what happens from there. So, well that's, that's a wonderful machine, 1080. I used it a lot, I think there's, from my, 
in my heart of hearts, I believe it really helped, especially the assisted work where you can set. Because one of the big problems with assisted work that I know approaches uh, may say, look, it's no good. But is they'll say, oh, we don't know what speed they're running at. Maybe they're running at, say, the guy's maximum velocity is 10.8 meters per second, tested. But now when we're pulling him, he might be running at 12. It's too far away to destroy some of the mechanics. Well, with this, you can say, okay, you run at 10.8, and now you run at 11.1. You can quantify how much you're going to pull them by and, and how fast you're going to pull them by. And this is just some examples of some loads of drills. Cleans and front squats, so we need to keep doing them. 
mm, how about we look at what we're not doing so good at? And concentrate on that for a while. So we get a balanced uh, specimen. And then these are the, this is four months later. Clean now is, is far above. Because obviously you don't completely stop working on it, but you might only maintain those qualities. Transport is very good, bench is very good, pull up is improved but still needs work, knee to ankle is improved but still needs work, pistols are fine, anterior core is improved but still needs work. So this gives you priorities for what you want to do in your training or how you want to think about what am I going to do when I'm not on the track coaching them? Because they've got to do sprinting. That's that's what they do in the sport. But what am I going to do in the gym? How am I going to figure out what should I do first? What should I prioritize? What should I just try and maintain? I also use uh, this, this is called a meter wave. Basically gives you two measurements. One is heart rate variability, which is the variation in the beats of your heart. So heart rate shouldn't just be like the 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 like a metronome. It should be, well it can be like that. Um, but it's likely that you're more likely to have a cardiac event less variability it hasn't, so in, in the beat, so if it's da 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 this means you're probably more likely to perform well and also less likely to have a cardiac event if you're at cardiac risk. So it gives you that measure of heart rate variability, which is, which is pretty cool. The most important thing about it though is it gives you a measure of direct current potential, this is my mind, direct current potential is essentially you put an electrode here, an electrode on the your eminence, your thumb, and it measures the speed of current from centre to periphery. Now the speed of current can be too high or too low. If it's too high, you're overexcited. I'm sure we've all had, uh, we know of athletes that kind of twitch, especially some of the really fast guys that are what's wrong with you, man? Have you had too much coffee or something? Um, or, and to be honest, I haven't had, I've almost never had problems with that. But I have had problems with central nervous system function getting too low. Uh, and this is where, especially for a sport like sprinting and for the jumps, where there's a high nervous system demand, this is, to me, it makes a lot of sense to monitor this. Because that is what the DC potential actually monitors. Now, and this is a strategy that I, I borrowed from Randy, but one of the, and I'm sure you won't mind me sharing it here. But one of our aims for the 2016 Olympics was to get their direct current potential as high as possible within normal ranges. So it typically ranges from negative 15 to about 60, and high normal is around 30 to 40 millivolts. So these were these were things that we look at, and it also gives you a much better understanding of how your athletes actually respond to training. Now, of course, I use when I look at them. And they walk in. I also use a uh, talk test that I, I stole from uh, Matt Brown, who's an Australian swim coach. But this test is basically athletes, if they've been, if you've been giving them enough volume and intensity, the right combination, they'll walk in. They might say a little bit, you know, you know talk amongst friends, but they're not really chirpy. Um, if they're really chirpy, you haven't been training hard. Yet. They walk in and they're shooting the breeze, you know what I mean, and the, the they're going blah 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 and talking about what they did on the weekend. They probably haven't been training without volume and intensity. But that might be exactly what you want during a taper or around competition period. However, in say a training period, preparation period, you probably don't want them if they're walking in, you probably want them under like a little bit of thick. If they walk in and they look like they're just about to jump off a bridge, then maybe you've been training too hard. So that's I use these subjective things, but I also use these and with a particular focus on the direct current potential where I say, okay, what was this direct current potential up yesterday, what did it do yesterday, what did it evolve, how did he respond, and this will help you start to decide or start to figure out whether you need your guy or girl responds best to two days of high neural work or week, three days of high neural work or week, how much rest do they need to need between. How do you set up tapers, for instance, what if you do, you do Maybe you do a 10-day taper. But what if your guy's central nervous system, after his heart, last heart session, peaks up to five days? What if it peaks up to 14 days? Now, you don't get this immediately from the mega weight, but over time, 
and over time of looking at these numbers, you start to make start to see, okay, well these are the general trends with the athlete. Their nervous system, from this physiological measurement, and my subjective feeling about what they're doing as a coach, they might be 14 days after the last night session. That makes sense to me, okay, now our table's going to be 14 days. But I might have another person that might only be 5 days. And you can also use this to experiment with, hey, do we need to do like a, I'll take a step back. Most coaches will do an activation lift the day before an event is going to jump. So, day before a big event, you go into the warm up track, you do a warm up, then you go into the gym and throw a little bit of weight around. Maybe some light, maybe some heavy, depending on the athlete. It's a pretty consistent theme I've, I've seen across all the very good coaches I've worked with. Um, but, what if that doesn't work for your particular athlete? What if their nervous system function is high on the day before and then you do this activation lift and then the next day it's not so good? Well, well you'll, start, you'll start to get a feel from performances and from your subjective feeling about the touch. But you'll also start to get some feedback saying, hey, maybe the nervous system has dropped down after that. We want to keep it as high as possible. How do we manipulate these things? And then there's other things you can do. There's, uh, there's um, just an example, there's different types of breathing you can do. So alternate nostril breathing with raise central nervous system function. There's a thing called binaural beats where you basically put one frequency in one ear, you wear headphones, you put one frequency in one ear, one frequency in the other. And so the optimal might be 5.5 hertz. This one might be 6 hertz, this one might be 5 hertz. So in the middle we get 5.5. All these things have been shown to help the central nervous system function to bring them up. But the biggest thing is obviously rest, sleep, massage maybe, but this will start to give you an idea of how you figure out what you're going to do with your athletes. And obviously you also need to take into account the stage of the season, what this person is like, are they a raw beginner, um, what are their needs like, do they need to work on strength? If you've got your minimums, say for instance you can squat two times your body weight, there's a, there's a one that's thrown out there in research all the time. If you can squat two times your body weight, do you need to keep squatting much? You need to keep trying to drive that skill up. I would say no, you don't. You're better off concentrating on the things that are actually important to your sport. So if you have a person like that, why do you waste energy or, what, or generate fatigue in an athlete when you might not need to? Uh, I would say as a general rule of thumb, you're probably going to be doing some type of strength to power work on the four times a week. Four times would be a, a real exception. It'll be a, it'll be a, a, a raw beginner um, in an Australian environment. I've, I've coached a couple of guys for the last year as a sprint coach, uh, and I would say two would probably be my max based on how I feel about the other commitments outside of. Uh, they went full time professional in, in China. I work with full time professionals. You training in the morning, nine to eleven thirty. You go have lunch. You go to sleep for an hour and a half. Come back at two. Train from two to five, five thirty. These people can handle three sessions of, of strength and power work outside of what they're actually doing on the track with technical training work. But for people that, hey, they've got to go to university, hey, they've got to do other things, maybe two is appropriate. Um, and down to one, especially when you get into the later stage of the season. You also want to think of mixed or standalone sessions. So this session, this guy's gushing long, good long jumper. The plan was, we're going to do some speed endurance, then we're going to go and do some strength work in the gym. Speed endurance is 4 120s with a 12 minute break in between. We warmed up, we did that. Um, I was actually taking the session. Then Randy was away somewhere because uh, he looked up the long jump group, just a long jump group at this time. After the session, this is what I was left with. How am I going to lift weights with that guy? I can't. So, you, some people can handle that, some, some athletes can't. Like, it's, uh, I, it was, this was an afternoon session, but we had to change it, and this, this determines all your like, training plans. We had to change it, so when it, if we were going to lift weights after speed endurance work, we had to do speed endurance in the morning, eat something, sleep, then come back and lift the weights. Uh, so, strength development. Things to know. Three to four dominant lifts. Sometimes paired with what I call slow jumps, and I'll expand on this in a, in a second. 
Uh, I prefer percentage or velocity based versus to failure. You can also use RPE based as a way of quantifying how much you're lifting. Three to four accessory lifts. Some one leg variations, whether it's calf, hamstring, hip. It makes sense for me to do more unilateral variations than bilateral variations with the accessory work because essentially sprinting and jumping is a unilateral sport. Because my grandmother would say, jumping like this is going to help me maybe more with volleyball and basketball. Jumping like this is going to help me more with long jump or high jump. Right? Does that make sense? Uh, same with one arm variation, shoulder or other type work. And that would be remedial. This is some of the dominant lifts I use commonly. A low box step up. As a general rule of thumb for this, Three times body weight would be my aim for your sort of elite jumpers. So if you've got a 70 kg guy, 210 would be what I'd be after. Um, and just on another note, I come from a very modest athletic background, but in the past I had qualified for things like the Queensland um, State Weightlifting Champs. Um, so if I can, I, if I can do a little bit of weightlifting. I can squat. I can squat jump. Um, but the biggest difference between myself and these guys is really interesting for me to reflect on. All the bilateral work, I was at there or thereabouts, maybe just a bit lower based on relative body weight, in terms of how much I could squat, how much I could snatch, how much I could clean, that type of thing. But step ups, oh my god, the biggest difference. Them getting up onto a high box with say 60 kgs on their back, compared to me getting up on a high box with 60 kgs on my back. It was like I was stuck in mud. The difference was, like for me, I was like, wow, there's got to be something to this. And so it really formed my thoughts about what exercise selection I use, what that is. It makes a lot of sense to me. Here, if you're sprinting like this, you're essentially doing a step-up top pattern. Um, and I'm not saying you need to disregard squats or that sort of thing. We're going to include some of those uh, in these other lists. But I was like, wow, maybe I need to pay more attention to step-ups and what I'm, how I'm doing step-ups and using varieties of step-ups based on how my level of confidence compared to the rest of these elite guys, guys that can jump uh, 8.30, um, and guys that can run around 10 seconds, versus my level of confidence doing something like a step-up and how fast I can move them in something like a step-up. Give you another uh, another tip here. So this is a belt squat. Um, you can do that if you want to uh, take away axial loading on the athlete. Now, one recommendation I will make, and this is just my my feelings on it, but once an athlete has basic levels of core strength, I'd almost always recommend they wear a weight belt. Reason being, with them without a weight belt, without a weight belt, you have around 40% greater disc strength. Anytime you have axial loaded. So one, there's a health and longevity thing for the discs and, and lifting. Two, your nervous system. It runs through your spinal cord to your extremities. If there's compression there, and we can minimize that because the nervous system is your ability to coordinate this muscle, coordinate its speed. So if there is impact on it, I'd like to lessen that impact as much as possible from a performance point of view in case it is impacting that coordination, that neural coordination down the track. So if I can reduce that by 40%, then I'm going to wear away weight. Back. Um, and for me, it just feels safer as well. I, I, uh, and I've never, I've always, like one of the things you think of is you always do as much as possible to make things as safe as possible. And if it means uh, being, a, and, and I'd say this strength and conditioning comes in up. Nah, you're mad. You don't, you don't need to wear a weight belt, and the weight belt's a devil. But like, for me, it, it makes a lot of sense. There's less disc shrinkage, means athletes wear healthier spines later on, uh, and I'll probably also be meaning that they're not going to, their nervous system isn't going to be dampened, or their coordination might not be dampened following lifting from heavy weight. So that's what we'd call a slow jump in the background. Mm -hmm. 
Like I said, of course you don't need to run down a 100 meter track with a barbell on your back. You can decrease the time. So you can increase velocity or increase the acceleration to your angle power. You can also increase the distance. But when you're in a 100, 200 meter race, the distance is set. And if you can maintain the same levels of power, you can get more relative power by decreasing body mass. Um, one strategy I have used in the past is we use weights, heavy weights, and no matter what you do with weights, there'll always be some hyperbole. A little bit. Even if you're not doing eight, three sets of ten. If you're doing like four sets of five, three sets of five, you still get some hyperbole. But things I've done in the past is we do weights up to a certain point, and then we cut weights right away. So that means they can lose a little bit of muscle mass, but they fly further in the air now. Because I'm still able to produce the same amount of weight and the same amount of power, but the effect of them losing a little bit of muscle mass, a little bit of mass, relative to their levels of power, means that their relative power goes up. Or we get the meetings as well, um, just before competition, so they're a little bit lighter. So if the athlete is strong, or you're in specific preparation or competition, you probably want to increase peak power at the same weight, e.g. If I can reduce my peak power, say 3,000 watts at 100 kgs, my aim is to get to 3,500 watts at 100 kgs. Or, I want to increase, keep the same levels of peak power at lower and lower external loads. So if I can get to 3,000 watts at 100 kgs, my aim is to use 80 kgs and get to 3,000 watts. Once I can do 80 kgs at 3,000 watts, then I want to get to 60 kgs at 3,000 watts. So I'm always generating the same amount of power but using decreasing mass, so now for me to do that, I have to be accelerating what I'm doing much faster, I have to be using greater for the speed. However, if the athlete is weak, you're going to be doing more strength. And the goal is to increase the weight that you generate the peak power at. So say for instance, my peak power when I first start might be at 60 kgs, 2,000 watts. My next aim is to make my peak power at 80 kgs, then 90 kgs. And the aim is to increase both intra and intermuscular coordination. To do that really simply, intra muscular coordination is your ability to produce power within a certain muscle is going to be done through your traditional weightlifting methods. The ability for you to increase intermuscular coordination with as much more skill aspect involved is normally done through adding a little bit of external load, e.g. a 3kg weight vest, uh, ankle weight, a weight belt. The little or sand belt. These things increase intermuscular coordination. Again, it's skill acquisition. So I normally have one to two, let's call post activation potentiation, just clusters. Um, maybe they're going to be a double, a bi set, a tri set, or a quad set. It's just like a circuit of two, three, four exercises. It'll generally be a slow, fast, medium. Uh, set up with slow will be your dominant exercise. And when I say slow, it might look fast to people based on what the exercise is, like it's, it's not what a, a really slow squat or anything like that, but it's slow relative to the others. The slow exercise is always done within, for me, 10% of the peak power weight. So if, if it's a very nice individual, very balanced, yeah, they'll do peak power weight. If I think the individual is a bit weak and needs to work more on their force, they'll do 10% higher than peak power weight. If the individual is a bit slow, and already strong enough, they'll do 10% lower than the peak power. Do um, we have three to four accessory lifts and some remedial work? So this is what I call a slow exercise in this, in this regard. Tap, tap, tap. Fast exercise is generally going to be some type of running, low bounding drill. Medium exercise is generally going to be some type of uh, jumping drill. You can pretty much get anything from a triple jumper's coach's arsenal and put it in there. You can generally get anything from a sprint coach's arsenal and put it in there. So, like I mentioned, 
there's a lot, but a lot of this is also there as load. It's generating some type of adaptation, but there's a skill acquisition part of it too. One is learning how to do the drill without his arms, which is valuable. You've got to be able to coordinate your legs without your arms. Um, and there's a few other things. It's doing it a slightly heavier weight than body weight. Takes the bar off, does it, you'll feel like it's floating. So there's all these uh, little things going on. We've seen this one. Mixed strength and power. Sometimes you've got to put strength and power on the same day. So normally one, two strength lifts. Normally one uh, post-activation potentiation set. There's a trial or a quad set. One to two accessory lifts. The order depends on the athlete's needs. If the athlete is weak, you've got to go to their strength first. If the athlete is already strong enough, do power first. Power is what the sport revolves around. Um, and you use these days closer competition because now you can't devote it. Say, say with a long jump group or a sprint group, you can't say, okay, Monday we're going to do power, Wednesday we're going to do strength, Friday we're going to do power. You've got to shorten up if there's only two sessions. Now, say it might be Tuesday is going to be power, Thursday is going to be mixed strength and power <coughs> on the same day. Or it might be there's only one session, Wednesday is going to be mixed strength and power, getting up to competition. Or, if the athlete is adequately powerful or adequately strong, you might only need one or two of these days to be able to do it. So when I assess almost every variable every session. Um, I don't really believe in testing days by themselves, in of themselves, uh, because what if your athlete just happens to turn up on a good day? What if they just happens to turn up on a bad day? It's going to influence results, and if you make changes from that, say you go to an institute and You've, uh, you've travelled up there, there's a travel factor, you do some testing, and then a sports scientist will say, well look, we've got a problem here, we need to work on that. Maybe, but what if you just had a bad day the day before? What if today's not a good day? It's always better to put consistent measures throughout training to base your training decisions off, your coaching decisions off. So, I'm not going to jump and sprint variables almost every session, or I try to, depending on the resources available. Um, this can be graphic strength in this, can be flight time, contact time. can be as simple as laying down butcher, butcher's paper on the track, taking it down, looking at stride lengths, um, and also combining that with your iPhone, that slow, uh, slow mo camera, to see what's going on. Um, sprint times, record the weights used, the volumes, the power, both peak and mean. Generally, if you're going to do strength exercises, you use mean power. If you're going to do like explosive ballistic exercises, you use peak power as your main variable. And I go over this stuff once a quarter. And from then I create that little fancy graph I showed you before, and I go, okay, well this is where we need to do some more work on. This is this is looking good. And take that off a bit, you won't worry about that so much. And you just keep going back through this process once a quarter, looking at things. Okay, this is where I really want to focus on this quarter. And you have to combine it with what you know about, hey, what's actually happened? When are we going to competition center? What's happening with this person's life? Where does he need to work on people? As Jim we a lot. Uh, it's a hand power clean, very simple. But from using these measures, if you don't have gym wear, uh, you can use a push band, it's relatively economical. Uh, but what does it give you? This is relative peak power down there, but it will give you this optimal power rate for different athletes. So, for instance, green athlete, his optimal power rate is about 95 kgs. Now, actually, you remember that slide I showed you that had that perfect uh, the power mass curve? It looked really nice and smooth. In reality, this is what it looks like. It never looks like this, is like what it does in the textbook. It always looks jagged and peeled up and down and so but Red line. He's about 75 kgs, this peak power weight. Blue, about 85. Uh, this guy, see how there's basically a plateau here? I'd all, as a general principle, I'd always use the lightest weight that they generate the peak power weight for the reasons I've described in this lecture so far. You don't get to run down the runway, and long jump, or run down the track with a barbell on your back, or a weight just like the power. Um, so you always want to be thinking, what is the lightest weight I can use to get the most power? Special methods, I've spoken about pneumatics, uh, there seems to be more of a transfer to the high velocity power. Kaiser, it's a, 
Randy used to say it was a secret weapon. Um, he actually had a seated cart made for Mike Powell in order to try and combat uh, Carl Lewis back in the day or in, in consultation with Kaiser. And actually, one of the, I talked about the biggest differences in share um, for him to go from like a 10 2 guy to consistently around the 10. Um, although I was involved with Super 10 a lot, um, I wasn't involved with him when Randy was coaching. And obviously, having a, but my, I've got knowledge of what's happened and also my previous knowledge of working with Sue. And he's from, gone from a guy who's like a, always a, he broke, he got 999 from memory, he was like a 10 10, um, sitting around there, and now he's consistently 99. So his biggest thing that I've noticed from me watching his training, and I was in China last week, but, and, and me talking to people like Randy and what's going on there was one, um, actually, his plant infection strength with Kaiser was very low. So we'd look at people having been able to do something like two thousand watts, two and a half thousand watts with their with their strength. Sue was something like six thousand. So again, my grandmother was six hundred. Sorry, my grandmother would say, "Hey, there might be a problem here if you're only doing a quarter of what the other boys do." Um, and then also overall coordination and drills would be the biggest difference I've noticed. He's boys, like he's got this wonderful nervous system very fast, but there's actual coordination, being able to sequence things correctly from hip, knee, ankle, um, to mile. This is, those would be the two biggest differences when I think of what's, and obviously having a good coach when you surround and maybe a little bit more professional set up or being made to do things like covering. Those, all those things back into it, but the two biggest things I would say would one be this kind of picture of power. The power, I can't even say, not the, not the strength, but kind of picture of power on a pneumatic device and also coordination and drills. Flywheels, again, if you're not using pneumatic flywheels, maybe you're leaving cards on the table in your preparation practice. Um, I don't know why I'm not a huge fan of the You never can fully extend the hip in this exercise when you're using this machine. And I just kind of, whatever we do, we want to finish in the glutes and finish up there when we have natural hip position and we can't use that on, on this stuff. And I tried many different things and lengthen it and shorten it and play with it and it's, it just still fights with me with that, you know, position, tall position, when you need to finish everything, you can't do that on that machine. So, I asked you a question. And regardless of... Uh, some people would argue you don't, but technically you don't have to finish with forward extension in sprinting, even after you first step out of the blocks. Some people would argue, um, I'm not, not going to get into that, but in this exercise, it can still be beneficial. Like for instance, when you're doing a hanging leg raise, you want to work your abs, do you need to finish with forward extension to get a benefit to your abs? I don't think so. So just because an exercise might not finish exactly the same way uh, you do in a technical session, doesn't mean that exercise should be discounted. You'll still get benefits to your hamstring. In fact, you'll keep hamstring under more tension by only coming up this high. Because now the hamstring doesn't get to rest up here. So actually for hamstring work, it's probably more preferential that you don't come up all the way. Um, but I, I, that's one of the things you have to be aware of is strength coaches or speed coaches or sprint coaches, whatever, is that, I'll give you another example of the abs. You do hanging leg raises. In, in running, we want our toes to be dorsiflexed, right? So I've seen some coaches say, oh, when you do hanging leg raises, you always got to keep your legs dorsiflexed. But you actually get a greater overload on the abs if you have your toes pointed, because now the lever is longer and there's more work being done through there. So you just have to think about it context specific. <coughs> just because you need uh, get full hip extension, or if, you, if you're a coach and you want to promote full hip extension on the track, doesn't mean you need to get it on the right? An athlete, if they're smart enough, should be able to know if, if a person can't distinguish between between doing like a lift in a gym and having uh, having doing a certain movement, and then distinguish that skill separate from what they're doing on the track. They're probably not going to be good athletes. They probably wouldn't be there in the first place. It's a bit like the argument, oh, I can do too much resistance sprinting and it'll ruin the person's technique. Or above a certain weight, 10% of weight, like, well, if that was a, and I'm not, 
when, when, I, when I say this, I'll just point out a few things. If we were worried about changing technique and doing something with weight, we'd never do squats. And of course, if a person is, does something, it'll look different with more weight. But they would have to be motor morons for that. If they drill certain aspects at body weight and they run at body weight for years, and you give them a resistance sp uh, sprint session and it changes their mechanics during the sprint session, they would have to be motor morons for that to actually impact the drilling they've done over the last 10 years and the experience they have over the last 10 years. But uh, I, so I would, I would just be wary of throwing exercises out based on potentially not getting the same movements you want on the track. And just know that they can be used for other purposes, obviously. Um, blood flow restriction is another thing I've used. Athletes with beaten, beaten up joints that just come back from surgery, which is very, very nice. Basically, the fluids of blood from coming back up. You've got an expert in Australia, Chris Cavillio, who does a lot with athletics up in the Bristol Academy store. That is uh, my sort of go to resource on this. I buy my cuffs from him. Um, but I've, I've used it in many instances. On another note, I'm a big believer in protecting joints. I used to play football and uh, basically I value, I value my joint health and mobility after playing football. But one benefit, apart from Kaiser, not just improving high velocity power, it feels so nice on an athlete's joints. It feels so nice on my joints. So you can do a lot of work on these things, but the athlete's hips the next day won't be aching. And knees might not be sore from lifting heavy loads that or you might get traditional mass. So I mean they can do more technical training. Technical training is interfered with as much from their non-technical training. It should be an aim for every coach. And vibration. I use vibration a lot as like a potentiation stimulus, also on a rehab setting. Uh, you can do that and then they go to some jumps afterwards and the jumping should be enhanced. Alright, this is uh, this is it folks. I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you for listening to me. And uh, yeah, appreciate it.